The Garden of Eden was not in Asia, but on a now sunken continent in the Pacific Ocean. The biblical story of creation, the epic of the seven days and seven nights, came first not from the people of the Nile or the Euphrates Valley, but from this now submerged continent, Mu, the motherland of man. These assertions can be proved by the complex records I discovered upon long forgotten sacred tablets in India, together with records from other countries. They tell of this strange country of 64 million inhabitants who 50,000 years ago had developed a civilization superior in many aspects to our own. They described, among other things, the creation of man and the mysterious land of Mu. By comparing this writing with records of other ancient civilizations, as revealed in written documents, prehistoric ruins, and geographical phenomenon, I found that all these centers of civilization had drawn their culture from a common source, Mu. We may, therefore, be sure that the biblical story of creation as we know it today evolved from the impressive account gathered from those ancient tablets which relate the history of Mu, history 500 centuries old. The manner in which this original story of creation came to light forms a tale that takes us back more than 50 years. It was a famine time in India. I was assisting in relief work with the high priest of a college temple. Although I did not know it at first, he was exceedingly interested in archaeology and the records of the ancients and had a greater knowledge of those subjects than any other living man. When he saw one day that I was trying to decipher a particular base relief, he took an interest in me that brought about one of the truest friendships I have ever known. He showed me how to solve the puzzle of those particular inscriptions and offered to give me lessons which would fit me for still more difficult work. For more than two years, I studied diligently a dead language my priestly friend believed to be the original tongue of mankind. He informed me that this language was understood by only two other high priests in India. A great difficulty arose from the fact that many of the apparently simple inscriptions had hidden meanings which had been designed especially for the holy brothers, the Nikals, a priestly brotherhood sent from the motherland to the colonies to teach the sacred writings, religion, and the sciences. One day, being in a talkative mood, he told me there were a number of ancient tablets in the secret archives of the temple. What they consisted of, he did not know, for he had seen only the chatties containing them. Although he was in a position to examine the writings, he had never done so, as they were sacred records not to be touched. In discussing these secret writings, he added something that set my curiosity up to a new high point. He had already mentioned the legendary motherland of man, the mysterious land of Mew. Now he amazed me by the admission that the precious tablets were believed by many to have been written by the Nikals, either in Burma or in the vanished motherland itself. I became impatient to see them when I learned that the writings were only fragments of a vast collection taken from one of the seven rishis, sacred cities of India. The bulk of them was believed to have been lost. Still, there remained this opportunity to see what I might of the ancient fragments of antiquity lying dust-laden in the dark. Day after day, I attempted to discover some method by which I could obtain access to the hidden treasures, but my friend, although extremely courteous, was adamant in his refusal to let me see them. My son, he would say, a touch of sadness in his voice, I would that I could satisfy your desire, but that may not be. They are sacred relics that must not be taken out of their containers. I dare not grant you your wish. But think they may not be packed properly and they may break and crumble in the boxes I urged. We should at least look to them to see if they are safe. But this argument was of no avail. Six months passed. Curiosity or anxiety 
about their condition had won the contest over my priestly friend for one evening on the table in front of him two of the ancient tablets were lying on a cloth i examined with curiosity the long hidden tablets they were apparently of sunburnt clay and extremely dusty with great care i cleaned them and then set to work deciphering the characters that were in the same dead language i had been studying with my friend fortune was with me that evening for these two precious forms of clay revealed facts of such important, we both realized that here indeed were the genuine records of Mew. The history, however, broke off abruptly at the most interesting point at the bottom of the second tablet. Not even the high priest could restrain his curiosity to see the rest. It is impossible for us to leave off here, my son, he said. I shall get the next tablets out tomorrow. Fortunately, the next tablets he procured were not of the same series, but had to do with an entirely different subject, and in order to find the consecutive tablets, all had to be brought out. It was well, for many of the tablets had been so badly packed that they were broken. They were restored with cement. When I repacked them, I wrapped each tablet with tissue paper and cotton wool. My son, said the priest. I feel that a sacred warning was sent to me through your voice to safeguard the relics. Months of intense concentration in translating the tablets followed, but the reward justified the efforts. The writings described in detail the creation of the earth and of man, in a place where he first appeared, Mew. Realizing that I had unearthed secrets of the great importance in the internal problem, man, I sought the other lost tablets, but without success. I carried letters of introduction to high priest of temples throughout India, but in every instance I was received with coldness and suspicion. I have not seen any such tablets, each would declare, and doubtless they were telling the truth. Like my friend, they had probably only looked at the containers. Once in Burma, I visited an ancient Buddhist temple in search of my missing records. From where do you come? asked the high priest, looking for me with veiled suspicion. From India, I replied. Then go back to India and ask the thieves who stole them from us to show them to you. And then spitting on the ground at my feet, he turned and walked away. These rebuffs disheartened me somewhat, but I had already obtained so much valuable information from the tablets that I determined to study the writing of all the old civilizations and compare them with the legends of Mu. This I did, and found that the civilizations of the early Greeks, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Egyptians, and the Hindus had been definitely preceded by the civilization of Mu. Continuing my research, I discovered that this lost continent had extended from somewhere north of Hawaii to the south as far as Fiji's and Easter Island, and was undoubtedly the original habitat of man. I learned that in this beautiful country there had lived a people that colonized the earth and the land had been obliterated by terrific earthquakes and submerged 12,000 years ago and had vanished in the cortex of fire and water. Also, I learned an original story of the creation of the world. It was on the continent of Mew that man first came. I have traced the story from Mew to India where colonizers from the vanished continent had settled from India into Egypt, from Egypt to the temple where Moses copied it, and from Moses to the faulty translations of Ezra 800 years later. The plausibility of this will appear even to those who have not studied the subject carefully when they see the close resemblances between the story of the creation as we know it and the tradition that originated in Mu. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Thank you. 
James Churchwood was an engineer, an author, an explorer, and most notably a mystic. In my opinion, James Churchwood led an extraordinary life. However, the more you study about James Churchwood and his work, you learn how he was not taken seriously by his peers. In fact, sadly, in my research into James Churchwood, I learned that even his own family was very distressed by James' obsession with figuring out what this missing land of Mew really is and what the real story of mankind is all about. Although, as of recently, his great-grandson, Jack Churchwood, has done a lot to reinvigorate and bring life back to his great-grandfather's work. James Churchwood was born on the 27th of February, 1851. He was one of five boys and four girls. Interestingly enough, he was born in Devon in the United Kingdom, and in the area where he was born, there is a lot of mystical stuff. I mean, there's a lot of mystical stuff in, in England anyway, but there are a lot of like stone monoliths and, and that kind of stuff that was already kind of around James as he was growing up. James himself would go on to be considered an occultist. And, and as we've said many times on this channel, I think a lot of people are afraid of the word occult. But all occult means is hidden knowledge. That's, that's all it means. It's neither good nor bad. It's just hidden. How you use it is what makes it good or bad. But we do know that this, this level of mysticism must have been uh, around his family growing up. Because interestingly enough, just a side note, James does have a brother named Albert who will go on to be an author about Freemasonry, which is really, really, really fascinating to me. So it tells me that this must have been something that probably was was spoken about, this, this mysticism, this kind of like more um, woo-woo or metaphysical well, spirituality. This must have been prevalent in his childhood growing up if his brother too was kind of following in the same footsteps. In 1871, James Churchwood married Lady Mary Julia Stevenson. So who were the Stevenson? Well, the Stevensons owned tea plantation and what is now Sri Lanka. Lady Julia, as she was known, would lose her father at a very young age to an Indian uprising. And so Julia herself, Lady Julia, would end up being raised basically by the royal family. Now, I want to note that at this time, what is now Sri Lanka, along with India, was under English domain. In fact, India would go on to gain independence from England in 1947, and Sri Lanka would go on to gain independence independence from India a year later in 1948. But at this time, the time that James marries Lady Julia, India as well as Sri Lanka are all owned by the crown. Soon after James and Lady Julia are married, they are back in Sri Lanka. And in 1872, just one year after their marriage, their first son, James Alexander Churchward, is born we also know that James himself had family members who also were stationed or worked in these British-owned colonies in the Far East because in 1879, James starts exploring the Pacific side of the Asian continent. And we know that he has relatives in his family that are stationed there because there is a letter in which he refers to his uncle, William, who apparently worked as a consult for the Samoan people. He Between the 1880s and the 1890s, James begins correspondence with the Les Plégions. Augustus Les Plégions was a British-American archaeologist and photographer who studied the history of the Yucatan Peninsula. Augustus was insistent that a lot of the Mayan symbols are the symbols used in Freemasonry today. He also believed that the Yucatan Peninsula was actually the cradle of civilization. He was also the first person to suggest a possibility of a lost land of Mew. In 19. 
14, Churchwood does relocate to Connecticut. And this point, Churchwood is actually pretty wealthy himself because as an engineer, he had patent like 31 different patents and he had won this lawsuit, which got him $6 million, which is a lot of money for the early 20th century. So he was able to buy this estate in Connecticut for his family and also use that money to fund even more of his research into the land of Mew. But no, nonetheless, from 1914 to 1926, Churchwood continues the Mew research. In 1926, he writes The Lost Continent of Mew. In 1931, he writes the book Children of Mew. 1934, he releases The Cosmic Forces of Mew. And in 1935, he releases the second book of The Cosmic Forces of Mew. James Churchwood would go on to pass away in 1936 in Los Angeles, California. But before we get into the conversation on this video today, I just want to leave you with a few points to consider of what James believed, the theories that he believed around this lost land of Mew. He believed that Mew sunk 12 to 14,000 years ago in the Pacific Ocean. He believed that 64 million white people lived on Mew when it sunk. He believed it was the lost land of Eden. He believed that the Mew people are our collective ancestors, the ancestors of all the races in the world. He believed that the Nikal Brotherhood were the keepers of the sacred teachings and writings of Mew. And in my opinion, more importantly, Churchwood took a very big interest into the religion, the spirituality of the land of Mew. He believed that the religion, the spirituality of Mew is the baseline for all of our religions. He believed that the religion of the land of Mew inspired such works as the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It inspired the Abrahamic religions as well as the Hindu faith, Buddhism, all the religions. Although he believed, like myself, like many people, that these religions got mistranslated and mishandled along the way. And he tries to pull the layers back. The belief of Mew, of the people of Mew, was that we were all a part of the divine spark. You see, the motherland of Mew and the history around this forgotten continent debunks any of Darwin's theories of evolution. Because Churchwood found in his research that the people of Mew were created, and they knew they were created. They were created by God, and they were all brothers and sisters of God. They all carried the divine spark of God. He believed that the people of Mu, a lot like it's written in the Yoga Sutras, that they knew their lives on earth and these bodies were only temporary and that their soul was eternal. Because they had such a deep understanding of this great concept that we see at the baseline of a lot of spiritual practices today, including yoga, that the people of Mew practice a very peaceful life. When Mew existed, there was no war, there was no savagery. The people and the animals coexisted. There was no eating of meat. Everyone lived in harmony. Everyone respected each other as brothers and sisters. And if there ever was a disagreement between two people, it was solved with respect and not violence. But what caused Mew to sink? And more importantly, my question is, why do we not know about this? I think I know the answer to that question. I think you watching probably know the answer to that question too. But in order for us to tell this story, instead of starting at the beginning, Hillis and I have decided to start at the end. All right, you guys, I'm super excited. You just saw the introduction to part one on our discussion of the motherland, the lost continent of Mew. And I have to thank you first, Hillis, because I've been super interested in like Atlantis and Lemuria and like all these, alter we'll, we'll call them alternative timelines. I've 
uh, the more and more and more I study our own history, even recent history, the more I'm convinced that Tartaria, that there's so much about our history as human beings that we're not familiar with. And so right. I thank you for bringing this to my attention because this is fascinating. It is. And the reason why it has been coming up, because those who know me know I am a Lemurian light worker via uh, Syrian energy. So I use Syrian energy through Lemuria and Earth energy to do the healing work that I do, the nourishing work that I do. And for a while, there has been this, I don't want to say debate or conflict of Mu is Lemuria and Lemuria is Mu, or there was Mu and then there was Lemuria, or Mu was first and then Lemuria came second, and then there was Atlantis, and then all of this stuff, it, it kind of gets convoluted after a while because you, there, there are so many versions of what people believe to be true. Yeah. And granted, you know, I'm always down for channeling information. I'm always one to connect and, and to to have that. But then when you have uh, facts to validate the channeled energy and information, the wisdom, then it just creates that moment of joy of, of, and happiness. And, and that's part of the reason why I started doing the research about Mu and, and what is Mu and, and and, the, and what really excited me about this process is a while ago, a friend of mine did a reading for me or on me. And he said, yeah, at one point you were like the king of Mu. And I'm like, I'm like, eh. and, and what makes it even more fascinating, we'll get into this, you know, probably the next episode when we talk about more of the symbols and, and, the, uh, and the religion of Mu is have a crystal skull and his name is Teo. And through the book, there was a symbol named Teo, T-A-O. And I'm like, okay, all right, what is going on here? And the symbol of, the symbolization of Teo is a capital T. And back then, they called it, or the meaning of it was resurrection. And so I just found that there's been all the symbology around me about Mu. And when, when I saw Teo, that just kind of like, okay, in, in the book, The Lost Continent, and I'm like, okay, all right, I just got to know more. And so I'm so excited to happy to bring uh, more of this information from James Kirkwood who went through hell <laughs> to, uh, to get this information to the people. And I'm surprised not a lot of people don't know about it. And keep in mind, this information was written in early 20th century, so 1930s when this was published. But since then, there have been nuances and things that really tie to his evidence that yeah. make it so real for me. And I, I was telling you off camera, like as somebody who is very open to the idea that we have an alternative history, I feel a lot of empathy for James, for the late James Churchwood, because he he went through hell and back. He was yeah. one of it caused like tension in his family. His first wife like detested him by the end of their life. Um, he and, and I will shout out uh, Jack Churchwood, which is yeah. his great grandson. I sent you one of it. He's got a ton. Of, he he worked a lot with Dolores Cannon. And out of all of Ch Churchwood's descendants, it seems like Jack is the only one that has actually taken his great grandfather's work somewhat seriously. Um, even his own father and grandfather were very dismissive of this whole obsession we can call it that i think an obsession that james churchwood had and we were saying you know when, when you get the loss when you get the book he kind of talks briefly in the beginning about how he discovered this and we were saying offline hillis um he didn't set out to be no. <laughs> the, the, that was not i do I don't think anyone sets out on a mission to disprove the known history, history? <laughs> i don't think i don't think that's ever anyone's intention i think 
when and it was just more so that he stumbled upon it because of his relationship that he had with the fisherman. Yeah. You he, know? Well, I was saying to you too, like I believe that, you know, we, with the law of one, they talk about you do have like particles in your D DNA that kind of allow your bloodline to allow you to be open to certain ideas. And if we look at Churchwood's family, I don't know much about his parents, but he was born in Devon in the United Kingdom. And even in Devon, there are like monoliths. There are like these crazy so he was born in an area where there was always already kind of a mystical charge. And his yeah. brother, Albert Churchwood, ended up writing like all these books about like the occultic arts. And so so obviously Churchwood came from a pretty open minded family. And I was saying to you, you know, he ended up in India because his wife, Lady Julia, her father was a tea plantation owner in yeah. what is today Sri Lanka. So he didn't set off to go to India. Like I went to India for a reason. I went to India because I wanted to find God, right? Like right. he obviously ended up in India because of family relationships. And I mean, how, how, dharma, how, how dharmic is that to have <laughs> this shit fall? Yeah. Like it literally just fell on his lap. These, these old templates. So, and basically, he was working the relief for the famine in India. The United Kingdom at this time in the uh, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century was owned by the United Kingdom. So a lot of governors of, of British descent. So that was common to see white people in India. He starts working with this like holy man and, and he kind of, he kind of, I, I kind of have to like laugh a little bit because spending so much time in India, like I kind of get like where... The Indian was coming from when he was like, oh, no, no, we can't look at these tablets. No, <laughs> that's very yeah. Indian. So what did James do that made, I mean, he kind of clever. Like, I don't know. Yeah, he was he was very clever in, in his approach because, I mean, you have to keep in mind that these tablets are 70,000 years old. Yes. And they were covered up in cloth, covered in dust never looked at because of the fear of the fragility of yeah. them. They may break or something, you know, that the writing could be one of, but he, he was very courageous once he started on this path. And I don't know, can we jump right in it, I guess? He, yeah, well, he basically told the guy, he was like, what if they're falling apart? And so then the Indian oh, yeah. got paranoid. Yeah, 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 I forgot. Yeah, what if they were falling? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and he was like, and then the Indian guy got hooked too. Well, also the fact that these were written in like a super dead language and only yeah. like three other people in India knew how to translate these yeah. tablets as well. So James was clever because then the Indian man got paranoid and was like, what if they are falling apart? Oh, shit. Yeah. We got to pull them down. We got to. And then actually, James, what he did was he like reset the tablets to make sure that they were safe. He put them in cement, like made sure that they were secure, yeah, put them yeah. back. And then he went on kind of a scat because they, it was funny. They had like translated one tablet and it kind of left off in a cliff. Hanging, yeah. And then they had to go in the scavenger hunt and find them. And then they got to another person who say who they, who, what they were told who has them. It's like, no, I don't have them. If you can find them, <laughs> you know, so it's like, this, it's, it's like this whole, this whole. Back and uh, forth. It's a yeah. scavenger hunt. Well, he yeah. went to Burma, and the, the guy at the temple in Burma was like, where, where are you coming from? And the guy, and James was like, India. And he goes, well, then go back to India, because they stole them from us. Yeah, exactly. So it's like this whole, it's, it's like, what do you do type of situation? And and so I, I guess, you know, we've been keeping people waiting for about a month now. So I guess we can kind of, like, get into it and let people know. And so, you know, as in the introduction, you know, it's a, people always want to know how do things begin. Yeah. It's easier to understand how the destruction of who happened. We're starting with that first, right? And then uh, we're starting with that first, and we're going to work our way backwards. And this is going to be, you know, I'll get to the revelation of, of the creation of who by the end of this. Yeah. But keep in mind that through this series, there would be, and even today, there would be mentions of different symbology, different religions, different cultures, and maybe even some other people. Because we have to understand the the context of what everything is. Yeah. To give it its full meaning to do 
it justice, if you will. Yeah. And before we get into that, I want to also talk about why Mew is such a dangerous topic um, for the powers that be. Because <laughs> like, when we talk about Atlantis, it can be this fantasy, like, oh, Plato wrote about it. But there is a lot of danger when we talk about Mew. For, there's two, in my opinion, there's two reasons why there's danger. Yeah. One, Mew was a very peaceful existence. They did not, and, and and it's where we all come from. It's our own motherland. So if we knew that, that we all came from this peaceful motherland where we're all equal, then all the strife that they try to create for division all of a sudden loses its power. Secondly, and to me, this is the biggest one. If we're working with Churchwood's theories, Mu debunks evolution completely. Yeah. I mean, and then there are people, oh my goodness, I can't think of the guy's name who did the documentary on Netflix about ancient civilization. Um, oh my God. Yeah. I, I can't think of his name. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I'll look him his, up. Hold on one second. His, his, his theories would skew history as well. Uh, Billy Carson, some of his theories about it. Uh, uh, Mathis DiStefanano, his, some of his theories would debunk it as well. So there are people who talk about it and hint around it, but there haven't been any direct conversations about it. Graham Hancock. Yes, thank you, Graham Hancock. Yeah, so, so we have these big, and I love Billy Carson. I, I mean, we have these big scholars. These aren't just like people that are on a whim. Like these are people like Billy Carson, Graham, Can Graham Hancock, who have literally devoted their lives to studying this stuff, who basically, it debunks everything, everything that right. we've been taught in our traditional education. So let's, as I said in the beginning teaser, guys, the only way that we usually when we tell a story, we talk, we start at the beginning. But with this story, we got to start at the end, don't we? Yeah, we have to start at the end. And, and keep in mind, this is approximately 70,000 years of history. And so the destruction of mood is not as everyone thinks, you know, because during this time, it was the pre dryad period that everyone talks about, all the younger dryads, because the earth was being pummeled with meteors, with, you know, potential flooding, everything. At this particular juncture, the earth has reached critical mass. But that wasn't the really of the end all that be all because at this time on the planet, there are no mountains, plainlands everywhere. So there's nothing, you know, higher than maybe a few hundred feet. And those are just rolling hills. It's not nothing like, like the Andes or Himalayas. None of that has been developed on the planet yet. And during this time, the motherland is situated between what we know uh, from east to west, from the chain islands of Hawaii, all the way over to uh, uh, Japan, that far. Then it goes from as far south as the South Sea Islands, and as far north it doesn't give an approximation, but keep in mind, this island held about 64 million people and separated in three sections. And it wasn't, it wasn't always separated into three sections. It was due to the natural evolution of the planet. And I'm sure you know, just for, say, you know, if people begin to see some of some symbology, but you may have a picture that's in the book you want to show. I will. There is a picture in the book that symbolizes the destruction of Mu and how it got separated. But before I get into the separation, I have to tell you how it really occurred. People thought it may have been a meteor. People may have thought it had volcanic eruption that was the telltale end of it but how it started is their gas pockets and gas pockets usually run anywhere from 15 miles deep and under the earth yeah. however yeah. they these particular gas pockets 
uh, or now gas belts. They run all across the planet. They were real, uh, particularly shallow. They came up to about three miles deep. So just imagine, you know, this very soft, you know, land, spongy land, and has gas pockets underneath. And typically what happens with the gas pockets, it's almost like they kind of like it gets this rupture underneath. This is why you always get the, the rolling effect, especially when you have new land. I don't know if people understand about the, the chainlands of Hawaii. It's created by gas pockets. And the minerals that are underneath, so when the gas pockets come up, the minerals are mixed with the water, salt, the minerals, everything. It creates the land, but the land is still sunk. Yeah. Well, this, in my opinion, created the land of Mu through these gas pockets merging with the life elements to create a lot of mass, land mass, that size. So in my opinion, that's what created Mu was the gas belt. Over a period of time, the earth began to shake and it had earthquake tremor, uh, tremors, aftershocks, all of it. And then it got so bad to where the island began to break up. And when the island began to break up, then it, of course, created room for uh, volcanoes. And if I interpret it correctly, if I read it correctly, it was mostly destroyed in the beginning by earthquakes and then by lava, by eruption. But most of the eruption wasn't most of spitting out lava and rocks. It was most of spitting up ash. Yeah. You know what it reminded me of? What's the town in Italy? Because when I was reading the book, it was like when the destruction happened and and it happened. So Mew was... I know. Yeah. I know which one you're talking about. The the, the big volume that was just that yeah. big black. It was Vesuvius that, that erupted and it, it like caught. And when they found the, the remains, like people were like in the middle of doing something when it caught them. When yeah. I was reading The Lost Continent of Mew, he talks about how he envisioned like... And this was a society far more advanced in te technology than we are today. Yeah. And they were like on their boats or having and all of a sudden, boom, they're just all of a sudden was this apocalypse. And, um, you know, I want to I wanted to also point out that he believed that the destruction of Mew happened only 12 to 14,000 years ago. That's yeah. not that long ago, is it? Really? No, we should put it right in line with what Billy Gray, uh, uh, Hancock <laughs> and Billy Carson. Billy Graham wouldn't believe in this. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Uh, Billy Grand Carson Hancock. and Hancock. What they what they put their time like even yeah. even Matthias uh, uh, Matthias De Stefanato, Even he talks about how it was approximately eleven hundred eleven thousand five hundred years ago, twelve thousand years ago. But the civilization started seventy thousand years ago. Yeah. Yeah. They've been around for a long time. And so with the eruption of, of the the land began to break up in the beginning with the colonies or the settlements, I'll get into that. There the symbol of the motherland was two peaks, it was like this flat land, but two peaks at the end, and then the the deity Ra in yeah. the middle, meaning that it was a valley. And oh. that the and that the ends were gone. The so the Hawaii and um, close to China, those have fallen away. But then you have this massive land divided into three sections, ten tribes. And so during this time when the eruption is happening, you have black smoke plumage, you know, then the starvation, then everything else that follows that. But this is also my belief of where the modern religion takes its definition of health. Yeah. The fire because of the stone. destruction yeah. Of, yeah, because of the destruction of the first civilization. I emphasize the first civilization because everything that we know today in some form or another stems from that. Yeah. And once the destruction was complete, the symbolization of Mu, and I'm so happy that I actually read the books in the order that I did because it gave me a, a better foundation. You have three peaks with the deity, and the first book that I read was actually the symbol, the sacred symbols of Mu. That's the first one I read. 
because it gave me a foundation to really understand what it is that I was reading. But before all of this, before this catechismic hellish function, you had these seven settlements or colonies that they referred to. And two of the most well-known or popular uh, that James Churchwood talks about is the Yucatan and North America. You know, there were also settlements in where was it, Burma, India, which is also connected to Hindu, uh, Japan, uh, I believe Canada was another one. There's the secret city, you know, Shambhala, which I believe was also connected because at this time, Shambhala wasn't raised up in the mountains. Shambhala was flat like everything else. There was no hill, so you have to take also take consideration. This is how Mu survived the destruction is through the colonies that it built out, and it even made its way all the way to Kemet. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we but have to go there. So yeah, go ahead. When we talk about the Yucatan Peninsula, I just want to shout out to another. Um, explorer, uh, to our archaeologist, a British American man named Augustus Le Plégion. Yes, yes, we <laughs> not to give if him it credit for him. James wouldn't have found this information. Yes, and I don't. I still don't know. So James made contact with Augustus and was in contact with him from the 1880s to the 1890s. He um, basically started his expedition into the Pacific exploration around 1879. So yeah. he really found this stuff and it was like it. And, and I think most of the people watching right now, you wouldn't be on this channel. Otherwise basically have found something in their lives that shook them to their core to the point where they right. couldn't let it go because it changed everything. And I still don't know how he was able to get in touch with Augustus La Pleasure. I don't know how that happened. No, that, no, that information wasn't disclosed in the book. But, but what I will say that amazed me, and it makes sense because, and, and, and this is how, when you, when you look at culture, yeah, the first thing you look at, you look at their cuisine, look at their food and what's influenced by. And when you look at Mexican food and Asian food, they're very similar, yet the difference is the term, is the spices that they use. And this makes sense when they read this in the book. Is that uh, how he talks about the uh, Mongolians being uh, in the Yucatan? I'm like, yes. how is this even possible? And yes. of course, you know, everything is done by chef. And, and at that time, when before Mu was fully submerged, because after it submerged, of course, you no know, water came up, took the whole island down. Now, mind you, it wasn't a lot to take down. There's not. Uh, a measurement of the thickness of the land. Right. But keep in mind, it was under a gas belt that was about two to three miles deep. In addition to that, you had an earth that was emerging and growing. So there was all these consistent earth quickening changes. So it didn't take much, but it survived for 70,000 years. But it reached a time when I felt that it was also going through a magnetic. Uh, shift as well. And I believe that was mentioned in the book of the magnetic shift yeah. that was occurring on the planet. So when you have the magnetic shift with, that causes the earthquakes that's under a gas belt, so it was all the signs that the land was going to eventually be submerged. But what was interesting is that it was a moon night's ride from the motherland, Mu, to Asia. So in 28 days, not 30, 28 day cycle, that they could reach there. So once it was destroyed, you have this, uh, this settlement. And reason why this, to me, it confirms this is true move settlement is because in the book of symbols, you have the symbol of the, if you look at the Japanese flag, their flag is made of a sun with eight rays and it's called the land of the rising sun meaning it's east and everything moves from east to west right 
and they always look to Mu as rising as the first civilization. And what was and Mu was to the east of Japan. Yes, yes. in the Pacific and Ocean. So, yeah, and so when you have the deity of the sun and the Japanese flag, and you have the eight rays, I have to go back through my notes, but the eight rays are also a representation of the colonies. And if you look back to the original flag of Japan, which is inverted to where I believe it's more of a blood red for background and a gold rays as opposed to a white and red. And so to me, the, the modern flag could mean it could be a rebirthing. I'm not sure what the modern meaning of the flag is, but the old flag is a representation of the deity and the colonies, the settlements that it, that it had. And so then, obviously, when the land was submerged, it knew of the other colonies because the colonies were in touch with one another. Yeah, they were. The, yeah. Well, let's yeah. let's kind of go back a little bit just because so at the point of cataclysm, yes. with the motherland. So we have this basically for all intent and purpose. We have this island that's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that yeah. is considered the motherland for all of us, all of us around the world. That's our motherland. That's where our people come from. And they sent out people and created these seven different colonies all over the world, right? As yeah. we know it, all these, you know, Yucatan, all over. And then when the cataclysm happened and the motherland sank, you know, we'll talk about the savagery and all that kind of stuff too. The, you know, we, we look at, and that's something that Augustus Laplagion La, La spoke about a lot with the Mayans. He's, he believed, and I thought this was super fascinating. So we, we, if we look at like occultism, our mystic studies or the esoteric studies that we call it, Le Plagion believed that the Freemasons had basically like hijacked oh, the yeah. Mayan symbols. And the funny thing is, oh, is yeah. he was a Freemason. <laughs> and he right. was like, we, we got this shit from like the mother, like this was not secret stuff. And that was one thing about Mew, Mew as well as they had this, I don't want to say like, they, I don't even like the word religion. It was like they had this knowing that, you well, know. A, that's our, what they called it. They, that's what, well, how James refers to it in he as a religion. What I find interesting is that with James Churchwood, he didn't call it a religion. I mean, he referred to it as a religion in the book, but it was more so about the way they worship. Yes. And it was more so of a worshiping uh, in the sense of honoring the deity, not in worship in the, in the modern sense of term right. worship. And we'll get into that in more of that next uh, installment yeah. of this. It's because fascinating. It the whole part of it, yeah. aspect of it is is just crazy, but but most of Greek, the Greek alphabet, part of religious symbolism, all of it is based off of the heretic language of Mu and the variations of that. And and what struck me, what really 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 got me, just getting emotional even just thinking about it, was that there's a, a in the beginning of uh, the, the continent of Mudez, uh symbol where he talks about the totem, about yeah. the, the totem pole. And I look at it, and if anyone knows or has seen First Nation uh, pictures or picturettes or vignettes, whatever you wish to call them, you know instantly that it's First Nation. Yeah. So this is how I know that Canada was also a settlement by way of the Yucatan, by way of North America, all the way up. And you have to think at this time, Canadian Canada wasn't Canada as we know. It was a lush, yeah. beautiful country. And so when you think about the movement of the people, of the tribe, of these 10 tribes that came out of move, you really have to stop and wonder what was it that we misinterpreted? What was it that we got wrong after their destruction and after the continent and after the the colonies, the settlements? What did we not? What was misinterpreted? What didn't we get? 
you know, and I feel like all that misinterpretation happened after we went down into savagery, but and cannibalism. We can talk about that later. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. And I think too, like I think what Le Plegion kind of and I haven't read his books, I was just reading the synopsis from from James Churchwood, yeah. was like we have this like these groups like the Freemasons who study this occultism and they keep a lot of information secret. But this yeah. information was being displayed on these old ruins, which kind of from my from my interpretation the altars. Yes. And it led Le Plegion to and Le, uh, Le Plegion was one of the first to mention the land of Mew. He was one of the first to actually start talking about this before Churchwood. And it was kind of like, okay, wait a minute. So we have these like secret societies and these secret information, but it seems like in the beginning, this wasn't a secret. No. And it actually goes back to the law of one because the law of one talks about that the negative polarity will hoard information, will have secret societies, will have all these things and they won't share the, but the positive polarity, it's, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. And so that kind of, that to me is what, and, and I do, you know, when we get into the religious aspect of Mew, I, I, you know, of course have spent a lot of my time in India studying and it, it's very, it's very re relevant to what is in these real ancient works like the Bhagavad Gita. It very much mirrors that. But yeah, so we have right before the cataclysm, I get what you're saying too, because I know the United Kingdom, we always think of the United Kingdom. I've lived there. It's very rainy, right? It's, it's not the best weather. But, but there was a time when the United Kingdom was tropical. And yeah. what we're looking at is the pole shift, right? So yeah. whether the pole shift caused the cataclysm that destroyed Mew, whatever, the chicken, whatever, what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> also, it happened, right? It also caused it happened. weather to change, which, of course, you know, as I said earlier, this whole Mew colony does debunk Darwin's evolution, which we'll get to later on, but there is one part of Darwin's theories that I do believe in, and that's called survival of the fittest. So I yeah. do think we see some shift in certain um, structures of humans in order to survive in now a different climate, right? Like right. They blue, like I have blue eyes, blue eyes can see um, they, they don't, they don't get snow blind. People with blue eyes have a better time seeing in the snow Versus, other, you know, so there's different features on the human body that could, you know, with a survive over time could have developed, right. developed in order for the different colonies. And of course, I mean, I, 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 you know, as we're talking about this, because we know Mew was a peaceful existence, everybody respected each other as brothers and sisters and as fractals of God. But when we, when it got into the savagery of what happened, what I keep thinking about is like what we experience in our world today when like yeah. a, when something happens traumatic, it puts people into chaos. And do you want to go there now about what happened like immediately following the cataclysm for those who? Yeah. Yeah. And then and then we can go back to to the other aspect to the beginning to really for people to understand what move was at the time of its height when it had 64 yeah. million uh yeah. People. And so after Mu submerged, of course, you know, it took time for the colonies to know, but during this time, you just knew something was wrong because there was full black spoons of smoke. People were drowning. People were yep. drowning and, and burning at the hearing. same time. Right. Yeah, exactly. All the, so the earth is literally shaking everything up. And when you have this beautiful, lush, country and then these colonies begin to experience n night as I, it's not really described in the book but this is how i interpret it is when they are in perpetual night because of the black smoke the ash that's raining down on them and they have to survive this has now becomes uh uh what do i do it's a dog. It's literally it, like doggy dog at this point. Yeah, I mean, all the conveniences have, are gone. Yeah, some some colonies, from what I would imagine, you know, stuck to their peaceful ways because how they celebrated death was through cremation. So they set people on fire, you know, and and and, and not <laughs> that came out long. Set people on fire. Yeah, I'm just on fire. But it was, it was a ceremonial rite. 
of key making. So that's how most of them, that's how when someone ended their life, that's how they did it. But during this time in other peaceful colonies, I'm sure there was other ways in honoring that tradition. However, in the place of Burma, that's where the, and why is it always Burma? <laughs> Burma's <laughs> like the scapegoat of the <laughs> I know why it's always Boma because that's where the cannibalism started. That's where the savagery started, and then that's where the de-evolution of the mental capacity started as well. Because if, when you read the book, and guys, and you guys, I want you to read this because there's a lot of a lot of interesting information. Because you go back and and James talks about how the discovery of the Neanderthal was in Europe. Yeah, and but no one dared mention about the highly evolved uh, uh, skeletons that they found in in North America, in specific in Nevada, New Florida. Mexico, Oregon, and the, and and next to because uh, I believe they were in last there was a layer of like the mammoth and then underneath that they found human remains, and they didn't study the human remains in America; they only studied the ones in Europe. Yep. And that makes sense because if you're in Burma, almost close to Europe, you know, they had to travel. And so they studied the difference of their of their skulls. And that spoke to the de-evolution of humanity because of the cannibalism and savagery that they fell to because of the destruction of this amazing paradise. And that's also pretty- known as the Golden of Eden. Just so you know. Yeah, the Garden of Eden. That's that's a, from the beginning. He talks about this was the Garden of Eden. It's interesting because Catherine and Edwards and I last week talked about the phenomenon of Breaking Bad, which I always thought was just a television show, but apparently I never watched it. Apparently, it's a psychological term, and what it means is something. It's when something happens in somebody to make them snap, to make them break bad, where they start to act in ways which they would never normally act. So we can say that what happened to to a mass majority of the people, you know, when he talks about he does a really good job emotionally talking about like the people who survived the cataclysm, like how for some of them probably wish they had gone down with the island because all this yeah, exactly. emotional stress of like looking for food now and we we had this super advanced I'm looking for your family, your brother, yes, your sister, your you know. Friends. Yeah, your your way of life has now, and it's not like it just happened over. It's not like it, it, the destruction of Mew happened over a long period of time where you could adapt to it. It happened in an instant, yeah. and so that shock. You know, I'm sure that they were were in shock. Part, you know, they they probably some probably disassociated, and so yeah. we can say that that was a Breaking Bad point where they went from having this society that was way more advanced than we are today to all of a sudden not knowing where they're going to get their food from. Yeah, but I will say this, and so it's interesting when when Spirit works with you and shows you little signs here and there. So I, I was watching the show, Show Gun, really amazing show. It's really well, well written. And, you know, when, you know, for me who like martial arts movies and, and, you know, those kind of, you know, Chinese films, I love them. But it didn't dawn on me because at the time, I think the Shogun takes place like in the 19, no, I'm not sure of the exact year, but I believe it was in that time period. And I was not aware how prone that region is to earthquakes. But after, but reading the book, seeing the show of children, it makes sense, you know, with all the gas belts, because gas belts are in that region. And so, there was an episode where they had an earthquake and someone said, yes, we build our houses so that in a way so that way we can rebuild them quickly. So in my mind, in my thought process, they move must have had earthquakes for an extended period of time because how he describes it in the book, it was somewhat... I don't want to say it was expected, but they were aware. That this could the happen, earth, and the earth right. could, plates could shift, yeah. Right, because of how they were. And part of the reason for this 
is, and this happened in Atlantis as well. So this is the thing that Atlantis, Mu, Ola Morga have in common is the is the extravagance yeah. of the worship, the modern day worship, is because at that time spiritual thought and science were one. If you were going to school for one, you went to school for the other. They Absolutely. were interconnected. Absolutely. And so this is one thing that you have to understand. And, and mind you, I feel that we're getting back to that today, 70,000 years later. <laughs> but I feel that in there, there was the beginning of a separation of science and spirituality. And the people who lived in this paradise were almost aloof, if you will. Say, like, no, 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 we're not going to believe this. No, 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 we're loving you. No, no, this is not going to happen. And so when the patterns began, the science was this right here is going to happen again. It's going to happen again. It's going to, it's going to keep happening. But the switch is like, no, no, no. We're just going to adorn our extravagant, you know, jewelry. Our, you know, and, and so it was in the space of disbelief. And right. when you have a space of disbelief, a space of disconnection. And so, which is part of the reason why I feel the emperor had the created the the seven colonies so it can survive because the the reign of the dynasties in the yucatan were had six kings reigned for thirty five thousand years just one dynasty same thing in japan the dynasties in japan like it was 17 dynasties and like six kings yeah. so you have to imagine that on some level they were prepared for this yeah, these colonies and other places and hoping that they will stay. And fortunately, they did. And so when they finally made their way to uh, North America, you have to think that when they came here, it wasn't as far west as California. I mean, they came through their way of travel was by boat. And the way that they entered into America was through the Colorado River, which was then much uh, lower than it does now. So you have this path that leads into these other spaces, which then the culture evolved into what we know now uh, as the Hopi or the Zuni tribes, uh, the Indian tribes, these the indigenous tribes. So they hold their stories. And, and what was fascinating, and I told you this, is that in the indigenous culture, they, they celebrate the first civilization in many ways. And it was the night of the Oscars. And mind you, I don't watch TV. It told me, me watching uh, an awards show. Heaven forbid me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just don't, I, I used to I used to watch them all the time, but I, I don't even watch value uh, other than entertainment. But this one, I, I was just saying, watch this performance. They talk about indigenous people. Watch the performance. I'm like, okay, I'll watch it. And they're doing this amazing drum circle it was just one drum in the middle of them beating and singing. It was amazing. And then they zoomed in overhead and there was a symbol of moon on the drum. And when you know what to look for, you know what people are talking about, you know what to celebrate. Once you see, and you cannot see it. Exactly. So, the, and so this is why, you know, there's all these secret societies because people, if the knowledge was out there, people would know. And I feel that if people knew the truth of what's in James Church book, books, it would change religion completely. It would change diplomacy. And, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about these nations having multiple kings or emperors. The United Kingdom, again, before 1066, before William the Conqueror came in and took over the royal family, there were multiple different, I guess we could call them counties. They weren't called counties back then, but different areas with different, like Boudicca, I've covered Boudicca before and her husband. And it's, yeah, they had different, and it's interesting. I want to kind of read on page uh, 293, if you don't mind, this one paragraph where he, the origins of Savory, because he, he says it perfectly. He says, a nation loses the place which it once held in the world's history 
when money becomes more precious to the souls of its people than honesty and honor. A universal widespread greed of gain is the forewarning of some great upheaval and disaster. Civilizations had been born and completed and then forgotten again and again. There is nothing new under the sun. What yeah. it has been. All what we learn and discover has existed before. Our inventions and discover our discoveries, but our inventions and discoveries are but reinventions, rediscoveries. The orthodox theory among the scientists of today is that man came from a brute beast to a savage, but from savagery traveled on by degrees until he reached civilization. Yeah. And but the savagery came not because we evolved from from animals, and we can get more into the relationship with animals later on um, with with Mew. But we became savages not because we were evolving out of monkeys, but no. because the circumstances of the predicament we found ourselves in. And I think about that now, like when we look at the Native American tribes, they would war with each other, right? Like the Navajo yeah. and what was it, the Ute, like did not get along. And that's where you get the Skinwalker Ranch from. And you see all these tribes of Europe warring and Africa warring. And it's like, you could kind of see it when, in my mind's eye anyway, when... Mew fell and you had these people trying to survive they would sit in their colonies and form little tribes and it became us versus them for food for land for things in order to survive and so we became savages where before it was abundance for everyone it was yeah. you are my brother we are the same let's just all live in opulence and and i do i you know it's funny you mentioned uh hillis about how people you know they had these tiny little earthquakes before and people just kind of wanted to ignore it well we still see that today don't we we still pe people yeah. do that all the time don't they yeah that won't I mean, happen here that won't happen here we're good let's just watch the kardashians it's fine yeah, and, and that's the thing, because when we live in blissful ignorance, sometimes we don't want to face the truth. Because sometimes blissful ignorance is, is a place of joy. And I get that, that sometimes we have to live in this place of joy, but sometimes the reality is, you know, when something is bigger than you, is in turmoil, and you choose to ignore it, then, okay, ignore it. But the problem isn't going to go away. The, you know, it's like, are you, are you going to be on the sinking ship when there's lifeboats over there. It's like, no, I love my ship. This is a beautiful ship. I'm, you know, when, what's the old adage? The captain's going to go down with the ship. Yeah. I'm the captain. I'm going to get on a lifeboat with you. Me too. Uh, Screw uh, the ship. <laughs> no, I mean, because it, it's, and mind you, there have been times in my life, person, where I, I have chosen blissful ignorance. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, because, you know, it's joyous. It's happy. You know, I'm not going to pay attention to that over there. That's just going to bring me down. And I get that, that. If you're living in paradise, you don't want anything to bring you down from your from this paradise. But there's also the reality of it. Well, if you want to live on paradise, if you want to save paradise, this is what we have to do. And so it, it just... As there's a lot of comparisons to the first civilization to now. One of the things that, that James talks about, it makes really, makes a lot of sense because people talk about, oh, yeah, there was five civilizations. There's no. There were only two. Then and now. Right. Because he breaks down how the colonies or the settlements were part of the same civilization because they were settled from Mu. They came out of Mu. They lived in Mu. And yes, they evolved through that, you know, whether if it was you, know, you lived in the Yucatan or North America, Canada, uh, the, you know, wherever, all these places, you know, you, and eventually made your way to Atlantis and then to Egypt. They all came from the one source, though it was thousands of years apart. And, you know, we started, you know, BC before Christ, that was like two, three millennia ago. We we're still in the same civilization. So yeah. I understand what he means. That it's only been two civilizations. There was, you know, before Christ, which is all of Mu. Yep. And then after, which is all of, you know, well, maybe even before Christ, I would say we'll consider us part before of that. BM, BM. Not bowel movement, but yeah, before move. 
<laughs> oh. I almost sounded bad. But you know, it's interesting. It's almost like, because I get this, Hillis, there have been things I've spoken about on my channel before that were very concerning and alarming that had come up in like the Cassiopeian readings or something. And I'll bring it up. And I'll have people in the comment section get mad at me for bringing up something that's uncomfortable but needs to be addressed. And this, right. it's, 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 this is where we get the, the term toxic positivity from. Right. Toxic positivity is when you won't look at something because you don't want to look at something, right? right? It doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't mean the person trying to show you this isn't a, is a bad person. You know, it's, it, and if we, if we can address the situation, like if the people of Mew had addressed the situation, then we, we might be telling a different story today, you know, but they well, well, I'll say that it, in, in, from, from interpretations that I've had, and, and at some point we're going to have your friend Jessica on to really dive into the energetic piece of this, you know, being a psychic and, and being of that space. I feel that there were some people that really wanted to do something about it in this, this time, like I mentioned just moments ago, well, the emperor was aware of this, possibly me, because I was the emperor at one time, <laughs> that that they knew that that island wasn't going to survive, so which is why they created the colonies. But then there were some people like, oh, you know, let them take care of it. Oh, let them take care of it. Oh. just paranoid. It's fine. Right, yeah. Well, not necessarily even, maybe not even paranoid. Maybe the fact that they knew that they couldn't do anything about it. Maybe it was to the point where, you know what? Enjoy what we have because we know this is going to last forever. We know this won't last because there was proof of it being destroyed they, were, they knew it was going to happen so maybe that was part of the blissful agents they knew it was going to happen but they chose not to but those that did did the best they could and then from that i mean just be thankful for and i am definitely appreciative of, of all the things that that has birthed you know has led to all the things that now develop in this world you know in egypt and all the teachings though most of it has been misinterpreted and so part of my journey in this is to find the truth of the spirituality behind it all, because in the heretic symbols of Mu, that's where all the truth is. This is where everything has been birthed from, because you have people looking for the Garden of Eden. They're never going to find it. It's not in the Pacific go, Ocean. Right. Exactly. If you, if you go down like 20, 30 miles, I don't know how far deep you got to go. But that's where you find it. And, and the thing is, he even talks about how Eve was created in, in this in this space. And and we'll talk more about that in the next episode, but it's more so about how everything has been misconstrued over the years. And that's due to the misinterpretation. And thanks to, to James, we in his studies, we have the correct interpretation. And this is one of the things that I've always appreciated about writers. When you find something, you write it in the correct interpretation. You write it, you write it in that voice. You write it so in, the, in that dialect. You write it in a way where, it's, where it speaks the truth. And for millennia, hundreds and thousands of years, things have been misinterpreted. Things have been misspoken. And it's okay because people were doing the best that they could. Yeah. You know, and and with that, you know, some of them may have, you know, misinterpreted for their for their own gain because I can easily, you know, if I didn't know, easily could have interpreted the destruction of Mu to hell. You yeah. know, like they interpreted, you know, the seven colonies. They could have been the seven archangels, you know? Right. Right. Uh, Seven's a big number in all spiritual Yeah. And we're gonna and get into that how all Mu. these yeah, and how these religions kind of were misinterpreted and kind of corrupted from the original teachings. And I guess we'll get into that point. We'll get into the Nicalls. Do we want to touch on the Nicalls today or do we want to wait on the Nicalls? Oh, no, no. We can wait on that because that's, that's what take the whole thing because the Nicalls is the religious sect of mood, just so you guys know. And so, honestly, if you guys happen to urge you to go out and get the lost content of mood and the symbols of mood so that we guys have an understanding and more of a context of what we're talking about, because what was even more fascinating is the proof of this everywhere, even after the mountains rose. And if you know anything about Nevada, if you know anything about Mexico, if you know anything about the West Coast, 
you know, about the cave dwellings. And people also talk about their drawings in these caves. And these cave dwellers were not only just drawing depictions of Mu and part of the destruction of Mu, but they were there before they were got there. Because yeah. they had to curb and date. So people thought these cave dwellers did these drawings. No, because they were thinking, how did they get up there? And how did this happen? And how did that happen? No, they were already there. Yeah. You have to understand that everything that we see in, in mountains or in high up caves existed before they rose. They were on plains or small hills that people could have easy access to. I mean, granted, they probably probably were skilled climbers. I mean, who knows? But it's just amazing uh, the amount of truth, especially in the Yucatan with, uh, with the stone altars yep. and the proof of these symbols. And if you know how to read them, if you know how to interpret them correctly, then the truth is in front of you. Yeah. It's nothing. I, I take everything with a grain of salt now because it's 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 so we just and i think when, i think when you are somebody else fa phrased it this way and i loved the way they phrased it and i can't remember i think it was Catherine edwards who told this to me but i can't remember who she was quoting so i apologize when you become arrogant enough to be ignorant when you become arrogant enough that you believe what you but that you become ignorant to what you actually see around you yeah. and um and I don't know. I know we're coming up at an hour, Hillis. Um, is there? Do you have anything else you want to conclude with, or any other topics you want to talk about today before we leave uh, leave our audience with this the destruction of our own collective motherland of Mew? Well, if anyone wants to really find out anything, the the best place to go, and this is why South America is huge, especially the west coast of uh, South America. One of the places that James Wood talks about throughout the book is, uh, I don't want to mispronounce it, but it's Eximal, Eximal Temple. Um, yeah, yeah we're, we're American, so if you're from if you're from the area, but it's spelled U X M A L. It's a place in the Yucatan, and this place predates Babylon, Egypt, and you can find uh, in India, you can find there, you can find in a few places uh, where there are pyramids that predate oh, absolutely. The pyramids of Egypt, and they come from Mu. They come from Mu. Uh, there's, yeah, there's more pyramids in the American continent than there are in Egypt. Like, they're everywhere. They're all over the world. Right, and most of them, right, most of them predate uh, the Great Pyramids, and people don't know why. Yeah. Because of the seven colonies were established well before then. And and so, yeah, when the, the next series definitely want to get into the symbology, going to get into the religious aspect, and even get into uh, some of the uh, Egyptian ties and the Atlantis ties to it, because people always want to put one before the other. This is such a straight. Mu, yeah. first civilization, and, and it was the start of everything. And Egypt is a part of the civilization, but it started you know, a few thousand years later. Yeah. As a as a colony, as a settlement of Mu. As a child of Mu. And yes. I want to before actually I'm glad for if we have if I get anybody in the comment section asking this, I want to go ahead and cover this. I know I covered this years before, but he talks about a heretical language. The word heretical, I know that in our minds, we think of it as something like blasphemy or bad, but heretical only means not in common opinion. So not something that has been accepted by common scholars, right? So like the heretical books of the Bible are the books that are not were not accepted at the Council of Nicaea. It doesn't mean bad. So I wanted to go ahead and cover that before, before um, I get any crazy Christians in the comment section mm -hmm. like, saying things that aren't true that are yeah that are live and, and and if you don't feel that it's true do your own research yeah I have what six books on the subject and only read three of them and then there's other books and, and what I ultimately want to do with the series is one bring this to fruition so people become more aware of it because one What's the purpose of us, you know, being hooked on Atlantis 
what's the reason for us talking about Atlantis and Egypt? No, and go so back the, even further. Right, exactly. And what's the purpose? No, but, I mean honestly, but why are we, why as a culture we've been so fixated on this fantasy that they've created for Atlantis to this fantasy of Egypt? What is the purpose of them creating this fantasy of now Lemuria? Because the Lemuria is like the big thing now. And so now let's take it to, and mind you, all of this is part of the first civilization, these 70,000 years of one civilization. That we all come from. We all come from this, according to James Churchwood. Like, right. And that means, and I think sometimes you're right, Hillis, I think sometimes we value, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. I think sometimes we value other cultures cultural experience more than our own but what what we're everything comes from you everything is like a child of Mew. it like comes right. from and that's why you see so many and i i was listening when when this weekend i was out running my dog and i ha was listening to a podcast with these people talking about Mew and the, the archaeological significance and these oh, yeah. guys made a really good point that i want to bring out to the to the people that may be watching this that are really hooked on like the the mainstream narrative archaeologists will not fund so so smithsonian oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they will not fund any type of research into something that could disprove what they've already quote unquote proven oh yeah so they so these are archaeologists can't like graham hancock is is, uh, is self-funded self he is he is the exception not the rule right like most people like i could not just go to brazil and start digging around without somebody funding me right so right. when we're looking at archaeologists when they want to and i want to point out that churchwood was able to fund his own research too because in 1940 he was an engineer and he had patent like 31 different patents and in 1914 he won a lawsuit over one of those patents that granted it sent him six million dollars in 1914. so that because he had won that lawsuit, that's why he was able to fund even greater expedition for himself. So, you know. Yeah, so $6 million back then is like $100 million Exactly. <laughs> and I will say that was part of the reason why I think his wife and his, you know, close family started detesting him. Because they probably yeah. had money and they were like, that's ours now. And he's like, no, I'm going to go spend it on trying to. Because Jack Tur Churchwood, his grandson, laughs about that. He was like. I didn't get anything from my great grandfather besides his good looks. You know, like that one was gone. <laughs> it was gone yeah, by the time. His, yeah, yeah, that half his book too, the the Mexican tablets. And so he talks about Nevin a lot in, in the Lost Continent. And and Nevin is a place where you find an abundance of these Mexican tablets that translate to the destruction of Mu. And anything that you find about Mu is always going to talk about the destruction first. Yeah. No matter what it is, they always refer to the to the death or the submergence of Mu. But I will say, on a closing note, that the flower of Mu is the lotus. Yeah. It's the first flower on the planet. Which what is that also telling? the symbol of yoga, one of the main symbols of yoga, too. And we're, I, I can't wait to talk about the religion because there's so many correlations. I know he shows a lot of correlations with, like, Hanuman, which I have here on my necklace, and Ganesh. And, yeah. yeah, and, and the yoga, the, what Patanjali writes about in the Yoga Sutras is very identical to what the belie he believed the belief system of Mu Muas, which we'll get to. But before we sign off, I just want to sum up everything, just to sum up part one to get people. And I love that we start with the destruction. Like, how did we get here now in 2024 in Atlanta, Georgia, talking about we have to go to the destruction, right? Like, why aren't we floating around in like spaceships going around? You know, because the destruction happened and we became savages. Our ancestors did. So I just want to sum up for part one what um church would believe from his actual research and again just to reiterate mainstream history archaeologists is not going to fund and they're not going to put any money into any type of research that's going to disprove all the money they've already spent on other research yeah right take all the conspiracies out of it at some point it just comes down to the bottom line right so they're not going to spend money, yeah, to blow all the money they've already spent, all the textbooks that have been written, all the degrees that would have to be revoked because, oopsie, we taught you the wrong stuff. So as this one guy was saying on this podcast, 
they'll see something that like counters and they'll just like drop it and leave it and walk away. Right. Like, cause they, yeah. It's, yeah. it's right. So that's just common sense. So what did church, which is to sum it up, he believed that there was a civilization that had z- existed in perfect harmony for 70,000 years before its destruction. And he believed that the destruction happened 12 to 14,000 years ago in the Pacific Ocean. He believes 60 more mil- 64 million people lived on the island of Mew when it's, it sunk. He believed it was the lost land of Eden. And he believed the people of Mew were our collective ancestors. Yes. And this is going to surprise a lot of people because of the location. Most of them were white. Yep, I wrote that in my notes. Most of them were white people. Yeah, they are, the white people went to all the seven colonies. So there you go. Explains why the Native Americans, which I've talked about on Gnostic TV, linked to Gnostic TV is down below. When I've done, when I did my Moon Eyed People episode, um, a lot of the Native American tribes and guys i say this i'm not i'm I'm quoting the twit cherokee when i say this they knew that there were white tribes and there were red tribes as they called them white so they knew that there were white people on the american continent so they were not surprised when more white people showed up on boats they already knew about white people so uh, this definitely but but i think hillis i think if we focus so much on like this is our joint motherland that takes racism like out of the yeah it does because uh, that's because you know growing up and i know we're running over but i think this this piece is important you know it which created the part of the racial divide yeah you know growing up you know i've always heard the africa of the motherland that we all come from Africa, that we all do this. And, and and I will say there's a portion is because that was a settlement. So it's part true in terms of this, but right, but it's not the full story. That's part two of the motherland. That's the second part of the motherland. You know, if and if you want to go that route, then North America is part is the motherland. And then India is the motherland. You have all these different settlement so if you want to say one without the other you can't there's no yeah. way there's no exception to that and so hearing this term motherland refer to mute now mind you if i was a teenager hearing about this i would have been all up and um, say what are you talking about you know but there's the place where we have to come to an acceptance and some form of agreement that the the core of the the creation of our of our land the creation of who we are it began with the story that we get into the next one it began with the story of the tree of life and the serpent yes well and i will say too when you talk about the white people i don't know if you wanted to go there or not um i don't know if it was from james book where he said this or if it was jack churchwood that said this it wasn't just any white people and you know how i said earlier like blue eyes can see in the snow the white people of mew were dark hair dark eyed and olive colored skin so even if you look at the destruction of the colonization and how it started to change our dna even for white people like me who are blonde hair and blue eyed did the blue eyes adapt over time because my group of mu I don't know muians new people of you went to northern Europe I don't know you know I have no idea but it's the truth but that's that's what if we all were taught white yeah. black Asian whatever if we all were taught I'm still looking for the blue I mean we talk about the blue people in Egyptian hieroglyphics like where the yeah. blue people you know yeah. blue people like if we are all taught that we came from this one specific if you want to call it race, race of people, and then we just changed as we adapted to our environment, right. then racism comes out. It's just, it's just not, it's a, it's a non thing. It's just not a yeah, thing. Yeah, it's not a thing. Not a and, thing. And you know, when he talks about the Mongolians being in the Yucatan, I mean, come on, that that's enough right there to say you know that it doesn't matter what you call. The motherland. It doesn't matter what you call this or what you call that. It's all one same, the same thing. And I can't wait to re- get into the dive into the creation and the symbology behind it because I think this is really going to fascinate a lot of people, especially you know, 
using the heretic alphabet of Mu and how it translated into what we have now today as our modern alphabet and the Greek alphabet. And, and so it was just fascinating. Yeah. So to sum it up for everybody watching, when we talk about watch the next episode, watch the next episode. And when we talk about the lost continent of Mew, we're not talking about some distant foreign culture. That's not yours. This is your culture. The, yes. Whoever you are watching right now, whatever country you're in, whatever race you call yourself, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is, these are your people. This was your sacred religion. This is the information that's still in your DNA. Right. And this is hopefully, and again, my putting my conspiracy hat on, this is part of the reason why I don't think they want us knowing about Mew because they like it when we're divided. Make them fight so they don't see what we're doing back here, you know? And yeah. so, so yeah. yeah. So, well, Hillis, I, this has just been such a treat. I, you have, when you brought this to my attention, I had never heard of this. I am now a huge fan of James Churchwood, RIP. James Church, obviously, he was born in, you know, 18, what, what he was born in. 1851 so so he's long 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 r.i.p a long time yeah. ago but um you know much much respect to his great grandson jack churchwood for continuing to spread his work for De dolores cannon who i believe is also r.i.p um for her bringing jack churchwood on to to really bring this to light as well it does take a village sometimes to to spread the word and i will put the link oh. on the I will put the links down in the lost the, for the lost continent of view. I will put that down in the description book uh, box below. We're going to talk about the symbols next time, right? That's part two. Is the symbols? Yep. So if you guys want to get ahead of the game, uh, get this one, the sacred symbols of Mu, and uh, we can uh, be on the same page. And I've also got the children of Mew, which I think we're going to talk about eventually too, as well. Um, which yes. I have not even cracked it open yet, guys. Me neither. I'm excited. That's the next one. I've been digging through. I know all of. I've been rereading, reading, rereading. <laughs> I told you, Hillis, that I read my books a lot in the uh, in the bathtub. So my books look real well, well, well worn at the end of of my uh, my my travels through through their pages. So, and also, you guys, ask any questions down below of any any thoughts you're having um, in in the comment section below. Hopefully, we we won't have any questions. It seems pretty self explanatory. Ending part one, which literally this was just the destruction of Mew. Next time we'll get into the symbols. We'll start to talk about the religious nature of our, our collective ancestors, X, Y, and Z. And I will also be including all of Hillis's links in the description box below as well, guys. So please make sure if you are not subscribed to Hillis's channel, please make sure to get subscribed to Hillis's channel. All right. Is there anything else you want to say, Hillis? No, I, I appreciate this time and really bringing this information mainstream because it's time. It's time for us to really know the truth of our first civilization as we are now in our second yes. and, and evolving into uh, something much greater than we can possibly imagine. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. And all those people that are hooked on the names mainstream narrative, you silly. You silly. Just read the just read the lost con. We didn't come from monkeys. Silly. That's silly. <laughs> That's just silly. <laughs> we came from a bunch of white people in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so, all right, you guys. Well, we love you guys, and I cannot wait to do part two. We'll be planning part two very soon, and we will talk to all of you guys very, very soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.